So part one, anatomy, superglottic squamous cell CA. This is really a summary of most of the information that we're going to talk about. These are the key landmarks. We describe everything, particularly relative to the ventricle. The upper edge of the cricoid is the second most important landmark. Cricoretinoid joint, that's going to be important as we go forward, particularly if you're doing endoscopic surgery, but it's important in its own right. The anterior commissure is where the cords come together. Paraglottic space is an important concept because this is really the radiologist realm. If you think of it, this is the mucosa of the larynx. You can see how easy it is to be examined by a clinician. They look in and they can see the entirety of the mucosa. They make the diagnosis of cancer. We just tell them how far it's gone and paraglottic space tends to be one of the areas that we will follow. Here is the epiglottis. Here is the base of the tongue. Here are the aryepiglottic folds going around. That's the entrance into the larynx. Piriform sinuses are out to the side. Here you can see the trachea. Here is the true cord. It goes from front to back. It'll be in the axial plane. The ventricle is the little crease above the true cord. It separates the true cord from the false cord or fold, whichever term you want to use. Everything from the ventricle all the way up to the epiglottis and to the upper edge is supraglottic. The true cord is the glottis and from the ventricle down to the lower edge of the cricoid is the subglottis. Well, sorry, the true cord plus the subglottis. The true cord ends about a centimeter below the ventricle and the rest is subglottis. However, we're going to put together and group the cord and the subglottis together. Here's the cricoretinoid joint. You'll notice it's off a little bit to the side. So we're going to come back to these over and over again. Why? Because it changes the, the disease. Lesions that are above the ventricle behave differently from those that are down below. The surgery is different. Lymphatic supply is different. So all of these things will be important in their own right. First, a little bit about technique. We use both CT and MRI. However, now we almost exclusively use CT. That's because we now have dual energy. We'll talk a little bit about that. Even if you don't have dual energy, it'll be appropriate for you to know about it. But CT, the key thing technically, is not to do a carotid arteriogram. You want the contrast to inject slowly. You want the tumor to have a chance to soak in the contrast. Then you can get the tumor to be a little different appearance than the muscles anteriorly. So here's carotid, jugular, they're well opacified, but we injected slowly so that you're able to get some contrast into the tumor. When we do MRI for the larynx, we only do it for a specific question. We don't do a general MRI of the larynx. If we have a question about the cartilage, then we would use a surface coil and do that sort of imaging. But that's to address a very specific question, and indeed, we really have not done one of these in a year because modern CT has gotten to be so good. All right. Now, these are the surgeries. These are the classic surgeries. This is an open supraglottic laryngectomy, and it shows you why the ventricle is so important. The incision is made right in the ventricle. So, that makes it important. Everything in it for a supraglottic lesion, this is the most important landmark. So open voice sparing partial laryngectomy is the classic. Here is a vertical hemilaryngectomy. It's done for a true cord lesion, and it can only be done if the tumor is above that upper edge of the cricoid. That's why it's so important. However, 
Now, with modern techniques, they extend it a little bit, but they can't unless we show them the relationships, particularly to the ventricle and upper edge of the cricoid. Currently, we don't do these surgeries either. What we do are translaryngeal microsurgery in many cases. But again, the anatomy is the same, whether you do it open or endoscopically, and you use various lasers to cut or to destroy the blood supply. All right, so here is what we want to do. We want to describe supraglottic lesions relative to the ventricle primarily, true cord lesions relative to the upper edge of the cricoid. So this is why we don't really have to look at the mucosa. We'll see if this works. We're looking down into the larynx. This is the true cord. Here is the anterior commissure, which is just where the true cords come together. Here you can see the ventricle. Well, if we can see it just with this, somebody that's really used to doing this can look out into the ventricle even a little bit, but any mucosal lesion, remember squamous cell cancer, is a mucosal lesion. Any mucosal lesion should be obvious to the clinician. But if we see it, then we are going to describe it firstly, particularly superglottic cancers. Think of it as up here. We want to know the relationship to the ventricle. So we've got to be able to find the ventricle. Now here's the cartilaginous skeleton of the larynx. You see the thyroid cartilage. Here's the cricoid. Here is the epiglottis. If we look through the thyroid cartilage, you can see the cricoretinoid joint. Here's the vocal process. So this is gonna tell us where the cord is, but it won't really tell you exactly where the ventricle is. That's about mid arretinoid. So we're gonna have to figure out a way to do just a little bit better. All right, let's see what we can do. We're gonna to try to find that ventricle just in this area. So let's see what we can do. All right, how do we find it? If we don't have a precise cartilaginous uh, landmark for the ventricle, let's see if we can do just about as well. Well, this is our marker, our index image of the larynx. Here's the thyroid cartilage. Here's the upper edge of the cricoid. Remember, that's key too. Cricoretinoid joint. And then this is the marker muscle, if you will. This is the thyroretinoid muscle. It's the bulk of the true cord. Medial most fibers are the vocalis muscle. But this is really something that's easily identifiable and when you see this, you know you're right at the level of the true cord. The paraglottic space is just a term given to the wall of the, of the uh, larynx. It's the soft tissue wall. So here's thyroid cartilage, cricoid cartilage. Here's the epiglottis. Here's the ventricle. And you'll notice a very different character above the ventricle and below. Here's the thyroretinoid muscle, and right above that, it switches to fat. It's almost completely fat, but fat is easy for us to find, so we should know where and when we are very close to the ventricle, and it will be the transition from fat to muscle that is going to be the key. That is the ventricle. All right, this is the uh, sort of approach that we use. Here you see fat, so you know you're supraglottic. So it's right up here. Here's the ventricle. Here is a little bit of the thyroretinoid muscle. But notice as we go backwards, it disappears. And so we don't see the ventricle, but we see the upper edge of the muscle, so we still know where we are. Simply put, if you have fat, it's above the ventricle. If you have muscle, you're at the level of the cord. And here, down below, once you get below the cord, get into the level of the cricoid, there should be nothing. So fat, muscle, nothing, superglottic, glottic, subglottic. And here again, this is the drawing to show you what it is. 
All right, now a few superglottic cancers and we'll go from there. All right, here is the tumor that's superglottic. How do we know that? Well, here is the laryngeal ventricle. We've opened it up from behind. This is a total laryngectomy specimen. So here, this burrows into the wall. And once it gets there, there's really no resistance going up and down. So it, the tumor can fill the paraglottic space and will tunnel in between the thyroretinoid and the thyroid cartilage. So if it gets through into the fat, it can go right around the ventricle and cross that plane. That's why this is so important. If it crosses that plane, an incision will cut off a little bit of tumor. Now this is a total laryngectomy specimen, and it looks as though the tumor stops before it reaches the ventricle. But if it's in the paraglottic pathway, it then can pass beyond. So I'll show you a couple of those examples. The slide was given to me by John Kirshner that did a lot of the preliminary work on laryngeal cancer spread. So here's the ventricle, fat, and muscle. So here we have a lesion that is supraglottic. Then it goes to the level of the true cord. So from this to this, this means that picture the lesion is transglottic. You would think the transglottic means it's above and below the cord. It doesn't. It simply means it's above and below the level of the ventricle. Now, here's the fat. We also know this is where the cancer is, simply because that's what the clinician tells us when they uh, send the patient, because they will know, they will have seen this cancer. There's no differential. They're trying to get us to tell how far it's gone. Here at the level of the thyroretinoid muscle, cricoretinoid joint, upper edge of the cricoid, you know now it's at the level of the cord. And here you can see tumor along the inner cortex of the cricoid cartilage. And so here you have tumor in the subglottis. So supraglottic, glottic, and subglottic. Here is another case, same thing. Whenever you see fat, you're above the ventricle. Here, you have that very uh, typical appearance of the uh, true cord level. And here, you have a lymph node. May as well just mention now that most, if you have a supraglottic cancer, they tend to go to lymph nodes, but not into cartilage. If it's a true cord lesion, it'll go into the cartilage, but not lymph nodes. If it crosses the ventricle, then it can do both. So we'll show you that in just a little bit. Here in the coronal plane, you see our friend, the thyroretinoid muscle. There's the ventricle and there is the fat. Thyroid cartilage, a little bit of the cricoid, and then here you have the thyroid gland. So this is what you'd like to see if you want to do a partial laryngectomy. This is a supraglottic cancer, so it'd be about at this level. It does look like it's going into the soft tissues to some extent, but here's the thyroretinoid muscle, and you can see that you'd be able to make an incision above that. You'd be able to go right across here, miss the tumor. Remember, the lymphatics are all draining upwards. And so here, you can make a close incision, and you can still cure the patient. So this is what you want to see. You want to see the separation. This one is right at, here's the thyroretinoid muscle. You'll notice there's a little bit of fat from the paraglottic region. Here's the paraglottic, supraglottic fat. And here you have a little bit of fat burrowing in to that outer edge of the muscle. And that's what the tumor is going to try to do. It's gonna to try to burrow into that little crease. And if that's the level of the ventricle, if you made an incision, right through there, you would leave that little knuckle of tumor, and you don't want to do that. Can they take this out? Well, they can actually do a more advanced supraglottic laryngectomy, but they need to know about it before. That's why it's so important. Now, you can also have tumor cross the ventricle, just following the mucosa, 
anteriorly or posteriorly. Here you see that, here's the ventricle, here is the cancer, and here it's crossing right at, this is the anterior commissure again. It didn't cross it laterally, but it does right in the midline, because there it just follows the mucosa. Remember, it can't jump the ventricle, but it can go along the mucosa, or it can burrow into the wall and go around. If they tell you it's a supraglottic cancer, and here you just see this one image, because here's the thyroretinoid muscle, cricoretinoid, you know you're at the cord level, and there you've got tumor, you know it's crossed the ventricle. So key point. And that's the end of our first uh, section. So we will then move directly on to the second section, which is sort of a continuation of the first.